Okay, hello. So, um, um, Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. Um, this was published posthumously. Um, was written late as well. I'm not sure exactly when he finished writing it, but he didn't, at his friend's advice, he had it published posthumously so he wouldn't get in trouble. <laughs> um, uh, and as we talk about it, I guess you'll you'll see why he would have gotten in trouble. Um, so uh, there's a preface, um, which it's only two pages long. Maybe I should assign that. I should, but I didn't anyway. But uh, you know, you can look at it if you have a chance. The, so the the preface is a letter from the narrator. So the narrator's name is Pamphilus. So Pamphilus doesn't have any speaking parts in the dialogue. But Pamphilus is the one who's telling us the whole story. Um, so like all the things like at this point, it seemed to me that Demir was about to say whatever, um, that's Pamphilus speaking. So the preface is a letter from Pamphilus to this other person, Hermippus. And we don't know anything about Hermippus. <laughs> just that Pamphilus, just that uh, all we know is that Her Hermippus was interested when he heard about this conversation, Pamphilus told him about this conversation and he said, oh, that's really cool. I wish I could have heard that. And Pamphilus uh, writes him a letter saying, well, as a matter of fact, I remember the whole thing and this is how it went. <laughs> um, so, uh, but in the preface, um, Pamphilus first of all, introduces the three main characters. Um, right, so the three main characters of the dialogue, or dialogues, I guess. That is, I guess, each one, each chapter is a dialogue, and if they're all dialogues together, I don't know. Are Cleanthes, Philo, and Demia. And Demia, although it might look like a female name, Demia's pronouns are he, right? Um, so it's uh, not surprisingly is a dialogue between three men. Um, so, uh, um, and this is how. Pamphilus describes them. So this is on page two, where he's, you know, first he said how interested Hermippus was in finding out what they said in this conversation. And then he says, the remarkable contrasts in their characters still further raised your expectations. While you opposed the accurate philosophical turn of Cleanthes to the careless skepticism of Philo, or compared either of their dispositions with the rigid, inflexible orthodoxy of Demia. Right, so Cleanthes is... accurate philosophy. Philo is skepticism, careless skepticism, Pamphilus says, and Demia is flexible orthodoxy. Yes. 
Um, now, I mean, this, these adjectives here that Pamphilus adds, it's not clear how much weight we should give them because Pamphilus, so we know that Pamphilus was very young at the time of this conversation. I mean, by very young, I take it he's not like a child, but maybe he's a teenager. I'm not sure. Anyway, they keep saying how young he is. <laughs> um, and that's one thing we know about him. The other thing we know about him, which is mentioned on the first page of the dialogue proper, on the first page of part one, is that Cleanthes uh, is his mentor and a close friend of his late father's who's taken his education in hand and whatever. <clears throat> so, like, presumably, Pamphilus has some bias towards Cleanthes. I think, like, if we leave these off, we can see, and so this here philosophy means like dogmatic philosophy, not dogmatic in a bad sense, but dogmatic as the opposite of skeptic, right? That is the opposite of skepticism. Among the ancient schools, there was this, there were the dogmatic schools and the skeptical schools. Dogmatic just means believing something. <laughs> Right. Um, so I guess you could also say it's like positive philosophy. Trying to reach philosophical conclusions rather than just trying to suspend judgment and enter into doubt. And, you know, um, when you look at it that way, I think we already know that Hume is sometimes like this and sometimes like that. Or at least the fictional character of Hume that we saw in the treatise <laughs> um, goes through both those stages. Um, so it's reasonable to think that these two represent different sides of Hume. This one seemingly not. Well, I'll say some things to complicate Demia a little bit shortly, but it seems like inflexible orthodoxy doesn't sound like a mood that Hume is ever in. <laughs> um, right? Sometimes he's in a sanguine mood, although here in this book, the humors are different. Actually, Philo calls Cleanthes phlegmatic. The accurate philosophy is associated with phlegm now. Um, uh, well, so I'm not sure what that means. But um, um, but in any case, sometimes Hume is in a sanguine mood and he sets out to write systematic philosophy, and then sometimes he gets into a skeptical mood. And he and he says uh, that nothing is going to come of any of this. Um, although Philo again is not melancholic, um, anything but. So something complicated has happened. Hold on one second. I just noticed my laptop is unplugged. That's better. All right. Um, these, these names, these are all real ancient names, or at least they're uh, names of characters in ancient comedies, <laughs> um, with satires. Uh, some of them are names of real people. Um, Cleanthes was actually a Stoic philosopher, but I doubt that's what Hume is thinking of here. He maybe is probably thinking about what the names, names mean. 
right? So Cleanthes means something like flowering flame, uh, flowering fame, right? Like a brilliant fame or something like that. Um, Philo means friend, and Demia means like of the people or something like that. Um, but uh, I'm not sure what else to do with that. Uh, may, it may not be that important. He just had to choose some names, but I don't know. Okay, so that's one thing that happens as a preface that, that wasn't a sign. So, I mean, like you could gather that from reading the dialogue, right? But it's nice to see it in black and white. At least according to Pamphilus, this is what the characters represent. Um, the other thing the preface discusses is the reasons for writing philosophical dialogues. Um, Now, it's a little weird because in the fiction, it just was a dialogue, right? Like, I mean, Pamphilus didn't decide to write a dialogue. That's what happened was a conversation, and that's what he's transmitting. But I guess the idea is like, why is it interesting to read a conversation? Um, so, uh, and so Pamphilus has an explanation. Um, I mean, that right there, I guess, is already a reason to doubt whether a Hume agrees with the explanation. Namely, I mean, Hume could easily have written the preface in his own voice, right? Rather than continuing the fiction and having this letter to Hermippus, who's just like, uh, you know, a completely empty character, <laughs> doesn't seem to be doing anything. Um, Hermippus means, I guess, horse of Hermes, but... <laughs> that also doesn't uh, mean anything to me. So, um, um, but anyway, so here, this is Pamphilus's explanation. So he make Pamphilus makes a distinction in the preface, which distinction Demia makes pretty soon when you get into the main dialogue. So, all right, it's already, it's interesting that Pamphilus, although Pamphilus says that Cleanthes is the best, Pamphilus in the preface sounds more like Demia. Perhaps without, doesn't realize that he's actually agreeing with Demia rather than with his mentor. <laughs> so, uh, but Pamphilus says, um, that the questions of natural theology, there are two different questions of natural theology. By the way, what does natural theology mean? Uh, basically, it means it's opposed to revealed theology. I think. I mean, Kant, and in the way I'm talking, I'm going to be talking about on Wednesday in the Kant course, seems to use natural theology somewhat, the phrase somewhat differently. But I think as these characters are using it, natural theology is supposed to be as opposed to revealed theology, right? Revealed theology is like where God told us that there's a trinity or whatever, right? But, uh, um, but natural theology is supposed to be what you're able to figure out with your own reason. So, um, and Pamphilus says there's two questions in natural theology, and one of them is, like, does God exist? And the other is, what is God? That is, what is the divine nature? And Pamphilus says the exact same thing about this that Demia says when he when he introduces this distinction in the dialogues. He says, um, this first question, um, number one, we really need to answer 
because the existence of God is the foundation of morality and the tie of society and whatever. So it's like really urgent to answer this question. Um, but fortunately, it's really easy because no one sensible ever denies that God exists. Obviously, God exists. Um, does Hume agree with either part of that? Probably not. <laughs> okay. Right. So, um, so again, it seems like the explanation that Pamphilus is giving is not necessarily Hume's explanation. But he goes on and he says, on the other hand, this question. What is the nature of God is um, we don't have to answer for those purposes. And it's super difficult, perhaps beyond human powers to answer. And then Pamphilus explains why these two types of questions are perfect for um, writing a dialogue about. So I'm actually going to read some of this, even especially because it wasn't assigned. Any point of doctrine which is so obvious that it scarcely admits of dispute, but at the same time so important that it cannot be too often inculcated, seems to require some such method of handling it. That is, that writing in a dialogue rather than in a systematic treatise where the novelty of the manner may compensate the triteness of the subject, where the vivacity of the conversation may enforce the precept, and where the variety of lights presented by various personages and characters may appear neither tedious nor redundant, right? So this is good to write a dialogue about because uh, it's so obvious that we don't mostly want to think about it, but it's important to keep emphasizing it. And so if you can write a kind of entertaining treatment of it, we'll hold our attention better. That's the explanation. And then he goes on, any question of philosophy, on the other hand, which is so obscure and uncertain that human reason can reach no fixed determination with regard to it, if it should be treated at all, seems to lead us naturally into the style of dialogue and conversation. Reasonable men may, may be allowed to differ where no one can reason where no one can reasonably be positive. Right? So the reason this question is good to write a dialogue about is because it's so easy and yet important. And the reason this question is good to write on that, and therefore like the entertaining nature of the dialogue will help hold our attention to it. And this one is good to write a dialogue about because um, uh, no one can reach any fixed decision about it. So I, I think, you know, filling in a little bit here, writing that systematic treatise where you demonstrate every step and whatever won't work. Um, so instead, we should show people drawing opposite conclusions and, you know, um, and see to what extent both conclusions are reasonable, something like that. Um, So does Hume agree about this one? As I already said, Hume probably doesn't agree either that it's really obvious that God exists. Um, in fact, he probably doesn't think that God exists, although that's controversial, but I mean, he was known as an atheist anyway. But I think even uh, uh, more probably, 
uh, he doesn't think that the existence of God is the foundation of morality and the tie of society. Um, so we'll see next time Philo and Cleanthes discussing the role of religion in morality. And I'll have more to say about it then. But I could just say right away, again, that I doubt Hume agrees with that. How, how about this, that this is beyond human reason? Well, I mean, Hume maybe does agree with that, but the person who cer almost certainly doesn't is Cleanthes. Um, Cleanthes thinks it's uh, pretty clear what God's nature is. Um, God is pretty much like us, only smarter and more powerful, <laughs> to, to put it in a nutshell. So Pamphilus uh, may not realize that he's, it seems like he's taking Demia's side against Cleanthes in giving this explanation. Um Okay, I mean, so like whether like whether this explanation is really Hume's explanation and whether Pamphilus understands what that that it's really it's really Demia's explanation or would be Demia's explanation. Um it's an explanation of something. What is an explanation of? Well, as I said, it's an explanation of why not to write. Um, in a different style, a non-dialogue style. Um, in that style, we're going to read one more thing from the preface. I guess I really should assign it next time I see this book. Accurate and regular argument, indeed, such as now is such as is now expected of philosophical inquirers naturally throws a man into the methodical and didactic manner where he can immediately without preparation explain the point at which he aims and thence proceed without interruption to deduce the proofs on which it is established. Right, so the non-dialogue style is that now Pamphilus says um, and here, I guess maybe Hume does agree because this is the way Hume mostly writes. Not exactly, because remember those things that like dramatic fiction that I pointed out in the treatise. But it's the way Hume often writes anyway. Uh, that you say, okay, I'm going to prove X and I'm going to prove it in the following way. And then you list all the steps. Therefore, X. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I guess you might consider some objections and reply to them and maybe give some examples or whatever, but it's basically that, right? Um, a list, it's a demonstration with a list of steps that prove the, the thing that you set out to prove. Um, well, I mean... What is the apparent point of writing that way? Um, so I think, I mean, the obvious way of back, backing up that as a good way of writing philosophy is um, based on a certain general conception of what's going on when you write a book and when someone reads a book. And in this case, it's in the dialogue proper, and it's in the mouth of Demia explicitly. So, I mean, um, so to explain what Demia is saying here, I have to set up the context. I mean, of course, everyone's done the reading, so you all already will know the context immediately, but just in case. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess that's why I didn't assign the preface, and I used to not even assign part one, because I was like, well, this reading is too long. 
But then I said, oh, but it'd be so much better to write part, read part one. So I made it longer. And then why not add the preface? I don't know. Anyway, um, so what's going on here is that Cleanthes, or no, sorry. Uh, Oh yeah, so Cleanthes has proposed this thought experiment. It's as part of an argument against Philo. I don't need all the details here at the moment. Um, that um, um, the example is, so first of all, imagine that there's a universal language that everyone understands. That's number one. I don't know how important that is, but anyway, that's part of the the setup for the thought experiment. And the other part is that that suppose that books grow on trees, <laughs> or generally speaking, on plants. And I think the I think the picture here is is that um, Cleanthe says that the books reproduce themselves the way plants do now. So like, I think in other words, like each species of plant grows one book, right? Like grows like copies of a single book and it like drops seeds. And, you know, from the seeds grows a plant that produces copies of that same book. Um, so like, if you want to, if you want a complete library, you just like gather a whole bunch of different species of plants and pick one book from each. This is a little bit differently than it works in the land of Oz, where I think there's just one tree that grows a lot of different books. Um, and they, they're not very good if you pick them when they're not ripe. You have to wait till they're ripe or else the plot won't be well worked out or whatever. Um, anyway, but sorry, that's... That's the land of Oz. This is Cleanthes' thought example. So, um, and so in Cleanthes' thought example, the books are good. Uh, um, I don't know if you have to wait till they're right, but anyway, the books are good. They contain like cogent arguments, for example. Um, and Cleanthes says, now, suppose if there were books like that, could you deny that some kind of reason was? behind no so like i mean these books propagate by seeds right like we don't see any reason involved in producing them but cleanthe says look if you found books growing like this wouldn't you say that there was some reason that the at, at, at the origin of these species of plants that like designed them right um how could you read these arguments and assent to them and be convinced by them and whatever without supposing that there was some reason behind them and at this point, Demia objects. Um, so even though this was aimed at Philo, Demia objects. And Demia says, um, your instance, Cleanthes, drawn from books and language, being familiar has, I confess, so much more force on that account. I mean, what's familiar is not books growing on plants, I guess, but just books. <laughs> um, but is there not some danger, too, in this very circumstance? And may it not render us, us, render us presumptuous by making us imagine we comprehend the deity and have some adequate idea of his nature and attributes? When I read a volume that is in the familiar case when I read a book that Cleanthes is relying on to make his example work, when I read a volume, I enter into the mind and intention of the author. I become him in a manner for the instant and have an immediate feeling and conception of those ideas which revolved in his imagination while employed in that composition. Right? And then he goes on to say, to me, it goes on to say, but of course, I can't enter into divine mind that way. Um, and so, like, if books re were really created by God, we we wouldn't understand them. <laughs> um, uh, and so, like when we find these, uh, like apparently human written books growing on trees, the hypothesis that they're God's productions doesn't really explain them, or something like that. Or we we shouldn't really reach that conclusion. Um, 
Now, again, like Cleanthes disagrees with the whole premise there, which has only started to come out at this point in the dialogue. But like Cleanthes thinks that uh, God's mind is not that different from our mind, and we could understand what thoughts God was having. But Demia, re representing the traditional theological view, and that's like it's important to keep that in mind. I think Hume's readers would have understood that immediately. But these days, like, you know, if you're not familiar with traditional philosophical theology, Cleanthes may sound more orthodox to you than Demia does. But it's that's that's not right. right? The tr traditional theology is that God is infinitely different than human beings and is simple and uh, uh, immutable and so on and so forth. And Cleanthes in saying that God is really a lot like us, but of course, you know, much smarter and more powerful than us. But God has a mind like we do. Um, so Cleanthes is actually being heretical, basically. Right. So anyway, um, but that's beside the point I'm trying to make here, which is the model that uh, Demia is assuming of what happens when you read a book. And it's it should be familiar to us from Locke. Right, it's Locke's idea of how language works. That in this case, it's not spoken language, but written language. But it's this, supposed to be the same procedure, right? Like the author has a certain idea, um, you know, based on that, they they, they find they form the idea of the word they're the, the image of the word they're going to write, and uh, somehow that image gets translated into writing the word. And then I see the word. I make the opposite transition from the image of the word to the idea of the thing it stands for. And so like this idea from the author's mind ends up in my mind. And if the author puts their ideas in the right order to make a good argument and writes them down using words in that order, um, then when I read the words, I'll get the ideas in the right order and I'll reproduce the author's argument. So, I mean, Demia has a little bit of explaining to do here. Uh, you know, he may have got himself into a little bit of trouble because um, what about the Bible? Right. Doesn't he have to claim that in that case, there is some point to reading it, even though the point isn't to get the same train of minds, ideas in our mind that are in the divine mind. Um, um, but uh, um, in any case, there's every reason to doubt that Cleanthes agrees with that model of how language works. Yeah, I mean, because we've actually seen another idea of how language works that wouldn't have this problem, namely Barclay's view. Right? Remember, Barclay says, you know, the point of my saying something to you is to have some effect on your will, basically. Right, like to get you to do something or not do something. Um, now, I mean, he admits that sometimes it accomplishes that by what by means of certain ideas that it excites in your mind. But he says that's not essential to it. Right, if I can have the same effect on you without exciting those ideas, that's fine. And it's it's I think it's true the other way around too. Right, that is if if it's helpful to excite certain ideas in you for some purpose, it's irrelevant whether those ideas are in me. I mean, I guess normally you'd say that doesn't come up because, well, I mean, how would I be planning to make them in you if I didn't already have them in me? But if it's like the divine intellect or something, then we can say, yeah, it doesn't have ideas. Um.
but it wrote words in a certain order, partly in order to enter, in, induce some ideas in some order in our mind, part, but partly just directly to influence our behavior, our passions and our behavior. Um, so going back to what I was saying about writing in dialogue form, Right. We had an explanation of writing in dialogue form. It was basically it was basically an explanation of why in this one case um, we the author might have other aims besides exciting the right ideas in your mind in the right order. Right? That is might need other uh functions of rhetoric rather than uh, uh other than order and clarity, right? Remember Locke said, except for the rules of order and clarity, all of rhetoric is is, uh, is deceptive or whatever. Um, so, uh, um, but here's a reason, or here's two reasons Pamphilus gives for wanting other parts of rhetoric. So like, I mean, again, we don't know if, it doesn't seem that that's probably Hume's reason, but uh, I guess he has some reason. Because he usually writes the other way. Um, right? He doesn't usually write in dialogue form. Um, so, I mean, we don't know exactly how far he agrees with Locke or how far he agrees with Barclay about how language works. Um, but at least he has some use for those ordered, clear arguments. Um, but here he has a use for something else. So that means we have to be, I think, like especially on guard to ask ourselves not just what is the argument here, but what effect does Hume intend to have on its audience by exposing us to this argument? Um, Yeah, I was just thinking today something like, uh, what if someone were to ask me, like, the world is in such a terrible state. What are you doing to make it better? You're not on strike. You're not on a barricade, you know. What are you doing? And I would say, I'm teaching the dialogues on natural religion. <laughs> Okay, I don't know. That's maybe that's going too far. But <laughs> um, uh, in any case, given that introduction, it might not be surprising that the topic of this work, so right, Pamphilus's explanation for why this work is the form of a dialogue is that this work is about natural theology and natural theology naturally leads itself to this dialogue form. But besides natural theology, there's kind of another thing which the book is about, which is um, philosophical education, at least philosophical education. Um, and Philo, Cleanthes, and Demia actually begin by disagreeing about that. Right, that's how they get into the argument about natural theology. So Demia starts um, by talking about the method he follows in educating his own children. The method I follow in their education is founding on the founded on the saying of an ancient. This is also, it's Chrysippus, it's another uh, 
ancient Stoic. Anyway, here's the saying that students of philosophy ought first to learn logics, then ethics, next physics, last of all, the nature of the gods. This science of natural theology, according to him, being the most profound and abstruse of any, required the maturest judgment of the students, and none but a mind enriched with all the other sciences can safely be entrusted with it. Right? It's unsafe to teach natural theology to the young. You should wait. And Chrysippus is not the only one who said this. This is a pretty traditional uh, view about the sequence of the sciences. Um, so uh, it's not surprising that Demia is following it as well. Um, and Demia at least doesn't forget, right? So so like they start discussing natural theology be, only because Demia is asking Cleanthes a question about education, about the sequence of sciences and mentions as part of that, that natural theology is gonna come last. And then like at that point, Philo breaks in and says, wait, why do you do that? And then they, they start talking about natural theology, but like Demia at least never forgets that that was the original issue. And, uh, you know, the fact that Demia doesn't forget it means that Hume doesn't forget it, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, because it comes up again. So this is in part two on page 17. Um, Good God, cried Demia, interrupting him, that is Cleanthes. Where are we? Where are we? Zealous defenders of religion allow that the proofs of a deity fall short of perfect evidence? Um, and then blah, blah, blah. Why spare my censure when such principles are advanced, supported by such an authority, before so young a man as Pamphilus? Right, so Demia is actually uh, uncomfortable about having this conversation in front of Pamphilus. Right, the whole conversation started because Demia doesn't think that you should discuss natural theology in front of someone so young as Pamphilus. It's dangerous. Um, Um, so this has a number of implications. Um, and this is why I said I was going to complicate Demia somewhat. I mean, um, on the surface, it and I don't know for sure that there's anything beyond the surface, right? I mean, it's very plausible that Hume would do this. But still, I'm going to say it. On the surface, Cleanthes and Philo are both really smart. At least they're both really, well, Philo is really clever. Um, Cleanthes is a little bit slower, but more careful or something like that, right? So they're both in different ways really uh um seem to be examples of good philosophers or people who are good at discussing philosophy. Demia, on the other hand, seems kind of stupid. Right? Like Demia often seems not to get the point until it's way too late. Stuff like that. Whereas Cleanthes and Philo will immediately see what the other one is trying to do. Um so um and as I said, it is perfectly plausible that uh, Hume would do that. Um, uh, he doesn't think too highly of religious enthusiasts or whatever. 
but we do have to to add the you know we're not Demian may not be putting forward his best arguments. Um, Demian may not be saying exactly what he really thinks because he he won't say it in front of Pamphilus. Um. And of course, if Demia ever said something like later to Cleanthes and Philo when Pamphilus wasn't there, um, we wouldn't know about it because this story is all being told by Pamphilus. <laughs> okay, so like, um, be that as it may, um, and you know, I mean, I don't have a lot of good uses for that. I, um, I mean. There is at least one place where I think and maybe is important where Demia is thinks something and isn't saying it. I I hope we'll get to it in a second. But um but but I mean it's just something I think we should keep in mind. I mean, in like in case this isn't clear already, this is uh, like a really complicated, tricky work. Um and we like not need to have all our wits about us <laughs> um, in trying to figure out what's going on. So uh, in any case, Hume presumably doesn't agree with Demia about this. That is, that you shouldn't discuss natural philosophy or natural theology except in front of people who are well prepared for it because Hume published this conversation for anyone to read, right? So um, um, so at least about that, Hume doesn't agree with Demia. There may be other things that Hume won't say, but uh, well, of course, we don't know if we're seeing, I mean, there's good reason to think we're not seeing Hume's own considered view about natural theology. So act, maybe you could say he does agree with Demia, <laughs> um, right? It's and and you say you may say, well, but it's not the same thing, um, right? Like Hume doesn't want to reveal that he's really an atheist because you know it's dangerous, but. And dangerous to him, but or maybe dangerous to his readers. Demia doesn't really want to reveal. Well, what something? I don't know. We don't know. It's not the same, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, that would certainly explain why it's dangerous. <laughs> um, okay, but in any case, uh, um, uh. It's clear that Hume is concerned to teach us something by means of this dialogue. But we don't know whether he's trying to teach us something about God um, at all. Um, or if he is, at least we don't know if that's the only point. Um, and it seems likely that that at least in addition, he's trying to teach us something about philosophical education and philosophical conversation. And now again, you would understand why that's one thing that you want to show in a dialogue, right? Like giving us a list of rules of how to conduct philosophical education and conversation is not going to be as good as giving us an example, you might think. Um, I mean, um, well, I, I'm going to give some some really concrete examples of that and just one second but before that i wanted to say that um you you might expect actually that somehow talking about god and talking about philosophical education go together right? i mean like this so apparently the charge against socrates was 
Socrates does injustice by corrupting the young and by not believing in the gods in whom the city believes, but in other daimonia that are novel. <laughs> that was the charge. Um, at least that's the re that's how they reconstruct what the charge was. We don't actually have it written out, but um, so uh, right somehow these things go together. Socrates doesn't believe in the gods of the city, and Socrates is corrupting the youth by teaching them dangerous philosophy or teaching them philosophy by a dangerous method. Um. Well, um, yeah, I don't have anything to add to that at the moment, except that you might like think why those go together with Socrates, why Plato writes dialogues. Is, is it the same reason Hume is writing a dialogue and is it the same reason they go together? <laughs> Okay, um, but just to show how the, the the dialogue form or the form of fiction is used here. Um, um, so like, here's one example. This is on page 41. Um, so Philo has just given uh, one of his many weird alternative theories for the origin of the world, basically. And Cleanthes says, this theory I own has never before it occurred to me, though a pretty natural one. And I cannot, cannot readily, upon so short an examination and reflection, deliver any opinion with regard to it. So, um, now, like, obviously, uh, Hume couldn't say that about his own theory, <laughs> right? Like, that is, um, Hume came up with the theory that Philo is just, uh um uh throughout so obviously he knows everything there is to know about it he's had as much time to think about it as philo has but really more right because he had as much time as he wanted to while he was writing this book and it wasn't pu published until posthumously so he had as much time as he wanted to revise it <laughs> um so uh um, so obviously, like, Cleanth Cleanthes is not speaking for Hume at that point. I mean, this is, like, this is an important point about Platonic dialogues, too. Like, w when you ask whether a certain character is just a spokesperson for the author, um, it's... Uh, the question isn't exhausted by the question of whether the author and the character believe the same things, right? Like have the same theory or something like that. The character and the author um, may be different just because they're in different positions. Um, they're not the same person. Right, so like Socrates is really different from Plato. Socrates was put to death, and Plato wasn't put to death. And you know, uh, Socrates lived in poverty and didn't take money to to teach. And Plato, you know, made a gazillion dollars by working for the tyrant of Syracuse, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So even if the thing that Socrates says is just is Plato's theory. It's still being said by someone who's not Plato, and that can be important. So, like, anyway, going back to Hume, right? So, like, here is a case where Hume is not using Cleanthes as his own spokesperson. Who is Cleanthes speaking for? Well, Cleanthes, I mean, uh, first of all, I guess, is speaking for the reader, right? Because we just heard the theory. <laughs> um, 
and moreover is trying to teach the reader something by example, how Cleanthes reacts. This is the care or like phlegm of, of, of Cleanthes that he doesn't just say the first thing that comes into his head, but he says, hmm, never thought of that before. <laughs> um, and then like Philo has to uh, press him to come up with objections to the theory. And it takes a while for Cleanthes to, to get them going. Um, well, it doesn't take that long. It's really just on one page. But uh, I guess, you know, you're supposed to imagine Cleanthes speaking pretty slowly at this point. Um, why then? It seems to me that... <laughs> um, right. I think when I listen to the LibriVox recording of this book, the LibriVox recording of this book is especially good. Uh, um, the guy who's reading it, forget his name, uh, read it just the way I just imagined it. So it was perfect. Um, all right. Um, so this suggests like, uh, a reason for the dialogue form that's really different from the reason that Pamphilus is giving um the thing you're trying to teach um it's not that the straight argument for it would be boring that was the first reason pamphilus gave and it's not that you really aren't pretty sure what the right thing to teach about it is, which is the second reason Pamphilus gave, but it's that uh, it's not suitably taught by giving you a certain train of ideas that leads to a conclusion. It's suitably taught by example. Um, okay. So all of that, <laughs> everything I just said is, um, that is the first hour <laughs> of this class was all about the dialogue form and the characters and what Hume is doing and what effect Hume wants to have on us. And I've barely touched it all on the actual arguments about the existence and nature of God. Um, and I mean, I think, like, uh, based on what I was just saying, um, that's probably the right proportion. <laughs> like, it's more important to Hume, like, how these different characters argue with each other than the exact details of the arguments. But the arguments are are interesting arguments, and they're they're intricate, right? I mean, so difficult to follow often. Um, at least my recollection is, um, you know, my experience is that students often find these arguments very hard to understand. And, you know, they're very they involve a lot of complicated, moves of the kind you make in philosophical arguments, but not in normal everyday arguments. <laughs> like, I agree that's true, but it's not true for the reason you say. It's true for a different reason, <laughs> right? Like, in a regular everyday argument, if someone agrees with you, you're done. <laughs> you don't care if they think it for the wrong reason. But in a philosophical argument, that can be a big problem. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's just an example of the kind of like weird moves that make these arguments co complicated. And um, and especially because they're three way, right, that like Cleanthes has something and Philo has an objection and Demia has an objection. And maybe Demia thinks it's the same as Philo's objection, but Philo and Cleanthes know it's different and so on and so forth. Um, so I should say something about how these arguments work. Um, 
Um, okay, so like, as I mentioned before, I still don't have to erase the board because I'm gonna start by going back to this, to Demia saying, what, we dis what people disagree about is the nature of God. No one disagrees about what God is. I mean, sorry, about whether God exists. Well, no one's sensible. Of course, we know there's some, uh, you know, deranged atheists out there, but, uh, and no one with common sense denies this. Um, now, of course, you might ask, how could we possibly all agree about this? if we don't agree about this, <laughs> right? I mean, what good would that be? Because <laughs> we all agree that God exists, but we don't mean the same thing. So there isn't one thing that we all agree on. Um, and like, especially if this is so hard that it's beyond human powers, what are we even talking about? So, I mean, I think the first answer is that what we must agree about is um, um, we must agree on something about God, or again, otherwise this agreement here wouldn't mean anything. But the thing we agree on about God must not be about the divine nature. So presumably, it's a relative description of God that we're supposed to agree on. So, like, I mean, that's what at least is supposed to prevent this from being totally incoherent. Um, now, if Demia were a little stricter, Demia would start to ask whether relative predicates, whether we even understand relative predicates applied to God. Um, but Demia doesn't seem to be worried about that. So, um, so for example, um, if we uh, take God to mean the um, original causal power upon which all de effects depend. We could agree on that without agreeing what the nature of that thing was. It's just a relative description, right? It's the cause of all these effects, whatever it is. We could all agree. So we could all agree that exists. There is an original uh, causal explanation that's, that stands behind all effects. But we might completely disagree or even be unable to say what the nature of that um, uh, cause is in itself. So that would be a good uh, outcome. The only problem is it seems like Demia, Cleanthes, and Philo are using three different relative descriptions. <laughs> um, Ray, that is. Demia, right? So, so for the time being, this one is off the table. I mean, Cleanthes is going to argue again that we do have a perfectly good answer to that. He can tell you what the uh, the nature of the the thing we're trying to prove the existence of is. Um. But in the meantime, we can say, like, Demia is like what Demia um, means when he says. God exists is that the proper object of worship and religion exists. So
So if you prove the existence of something, and but it's not the proper object of worship, or uh, can't form the basis of religion. Now, I mean, because religion and worship both are themselves kind of difficult concepts. What exactly counts as true worship and true religion and so forth? But in any case, uh, if you if you prove the existence of something that doesn't do this, that doesn't fit this relative description, then Dunia is going to say, well, you haven't proved the existence of God. Um, Cleanthes Well, maybe Cleanthes doesn't fit into this scheme. Um, but I read it something like this. Um, yeah, see, I mean, it's hard not to bring something that, that would be a partial answer to the second question into the answers. Maybe he really never banned that. Because I want to write something like will and reason. as cause of the material world. Or maybe even you should say something like, like as cause of the order in the material world. This part's not just relative. Um. But if you were to, I guess, just try to leave the relative part, you would say Cleanthes is thinking of God as the cause of order in the material world. Whereas, Philo's definition is the one that I mentioned before. Right, God is the first cause on which all everything else depends. So uh, Philo is the only one who states his his definition explicitly. This is on page fourteen in part two. Yeah. And here, Philo gives an argument that this is Philo. Okay, so I should make a couple things clear before I read this. Right, Philo at the beginning of the dialogue seems to take Demia's side against Cleanthes. Not at the very beginning, right? Because the very beginning was is Philo um, objecting to to Demia's plan of educating his children, right? Philo is like. Wait, isn't that dangerous? Shouldn't you teach them natural theology first? <laughs> um, because, you know, do you want them growing up without religion? And Demia says, oh, well, uh, I, don't, I, I don't teach them theology as a science when they're young. Of course, I teach them to be pious. Um, It seems like Demia teaches them that God exists, but lets them have a false opinion about the nature of God. <laughs> Ray, I mean, this is kind of unspoken in that, but it, it seems like Demia lets them um, believe uh, like probably a more anthropomorphic version of what God is. 
as long as it's something that would be a proper object of worship and religion, it's okay for now if they believe that, even though it's wrong. Um, but okay, so in any case, that's the very beginning. But then Philo, uh, after that, uh, you know, takes seems to take Demia's side against Cleanthes. So they're both arguing against Cleanthes. Um, and here at the beginning, Philo is is agreeing with with Demia that. Uh, um, Nothing is more obvious than the existence of God, if you have any common sense. But um, this is how he proves it, right? So nothing exists without a cause. And the original cause of this universe, whatever it be, we call God, and piously ascribe to him every species of perfection. Right, so... Um, That's what Philo thinks you're 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 trying to prove when you prove God exists, or at least that's the persona he's taken on for the purpose of this argument. In the end, it will come out that um, he's pretty skeptical as to whether God exists, <laughs> and he wasn't really on Demia's side at all the whole time. And Cleanthes always knew it, and that's why sometimes Cleanthes is kind of laughing when Philo says things. Um, okay, but anyway, um, that's the definition Philo is working with. Um, and the other ones, I think you just have to gather from the arguments they made. Well, I mean, this is interesting because in the philosophical tradition, um, at least like insofar as it derives from Plato and Aristotle, as opposed to from, say, Epicurus, right, like these three things are supposed to go together. Right, God is supposed to be the first or original cause of everything, and is also supposed to, in some sense, be a reason, have have will and reason, and be the cause of the order we find in the material world, and is supposed to be the proper object of worship. Um, but I think one of the main things that Hume is trying to show here is that. Uh, you know, to the extent that he is trying to teach us something about natural theology is that these things can come apart. Right? So at some point, Philo is going to say, this is on in part four on page 31. Um, Is, uh, let me go back to the board for one second. So, 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 like at this point in the dialogue, Philo notes that Cleanthes has only proved the existence of this, a cause of exist of order in the material world, and he's proved it. Um, he's proved that that cause again is a mind very much like a human mind. It contains many ideas and right, it changes over time and has desires and whatever. So uh, um, Philo says, well, you haven't proved the existence of God because this is not this. Right, this mind with all its parts and so on and so forth is just as complicated an ordered thing as the material world you were trying to explain. It also needs an explanation. So you're not done, right? That is, if what you were looking for is this, you're not done. If you're looking for the original primordial cause of everything, this complicated changeable thing isn't it. And that's, I mean, exactly how in traditional theology you prove that God is not like that, but is simple and immutable and whatever. Um, and actually, at the end of the Kant class today, I was trying to rush through Kant's version of that traditional argument, put in the minds, put, put in the mouth of a transcendental theologian. <laughs> um, okay, but in any case, um, 
Um, so it's in that context that Philo says, um, uh, um, well, let me just read what he If the material world rests upon a similar ideal world, this ideal world must rest upon some other and so on with, with what without end. It were better, therefore, never to look beyond the present material world. By supposing it to contain the principle of its order within itself, we really assert it to be God. And the sooner we arrive at that divine being, so much the better. <laughs> so, so Philo, I mean, uh, it's a little more complicated than what I was saying. So Philo says, you know, um, like, sees that Cleanthes might say something like, um, well, it's not true, even though the ideal world, that is the divine mind, is complicated and changing and whatever. It's not true that we need an explanation for that. It contains its own principle of order, right? So you'd be going against those traditional theological proofs um, of God's simplicity and et cetera. So Philo says, but if you're going to say that, why not just say that about the material world? It contains its own principle of order. And then he says, and that would be better because then we would be saying the material world is God and we've proved the existence of God. It's really easy. Here it is. <laughs> so, um, right, of course, we've, we've proved the existence of God in this sense, but not in this sense and not in this sense. Right? The material world is not obviously a reason or will that's the cause of order in the material world. And also, it seems not to be a proper object of worship or religion. At least not if we think of it as inanimate. Um, uh, elsewhere, Philo imagines thinking of it as a huge animal <laughs> or a huge vegetable. <laughs> But it would take a lot to get it into the category of worthy of worship. Um, whereas Cleanthes, um, a little bit earlier, said this. This is in response to Demia. So Demia does give that traditional view that God should be simple and immutable and whatever, and says that Cleanthes hasn't proved the right thing. Um, and Cleanthes says, I can readily allow that those who maintain the perfect simplicity of the Supreme Being to the extent in which you have explained it are complete mystics and chargeable with all the consequences which I have drawn from their opinion. They are, in a word, atheists without knowing it. For though it be allowed that the deity possesses attributes of which we have no comprehension, yet ought we never to ascribe to him any attributes which are absolutely incompatible with that intention, intelligent nature essential to him. Right, so Cleanthes is saying, you know, um, Demia, you're absolutely simple, immutable God, maybe the original cause of everything, and maybe somehow is a proper object of worship and religion. But it's not God, because God is will and reason as the cause of the material world, and the only kind of will and reason we know is our own, and our own is not simple and immutable. Right, it has parts that succeed each other and so on and so forth. Um, and as for Demia, well, I kind of already said how these things come apart for him. Um, and I think also kind of already said why he doesn't say 
but they come apart for him. And this is the place where, remember I said there's one place where I know how to use that idea that Demia is not saying what he really thinks. That, you know, the, the way these come apart for Demia is that um, it doesn't really matter what people think God is as long as they agree that God is this. So it's not dangerous to let your children go on believing that God is a big man up in the clouds with a white beard and whatever, even though, you know, Demia knows that's not the orthodox opinion. But uh, it's okay as long as that person up in the cloud with the white beard wants them to do the right things and will punish them if they don't and so forth. So if they believe that, we're fine. And that's why it's, you know, we can afford to put off study of natural philosophy, natural theology until it's safe. And, you know, and why is it not safe? Why is it dangerous? Well, precisely because once you start thinking about it, um, like if you're not sufficiently mature, you uh, might go off on some weird theory and then sure enough, you'll prove that something you call God exists, but it won't be this anymore. And you'll, you'll become irreligious and immoral. Um, um, it's too bad Josephine isn't here to ask questions about this. I hope she's not like in prison or something. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, um, but on I go. So, um, okay, so that's like the, this is like the standpoint they're starting from, and it's not promising because they're kind of talking past each other. <laughs> um, uh, like they don't really agree what, they all agree or claim to agree that God exists. And they're just like investigating what we can say about the divine nature or something like that. But in fact, they don't agree what they mean by this and therefore not even in a relative sense. And therefore they're not exactly arguing about the same thing. And um, it takes a while for that to come out. Um, how much that's a matter of like it taking a while for Demia to realize it and how much Cleanthes and Philo themselves take a while to realize that, I'm not sure. Um, so, uh, Okay, so, but in that context, um, the, oh, yes, Zoe. I guess I have a question, if you're going to ask for them, which um, is I like, always want questions. <laughs> so they have all these different ideas of um, what God's nature is. Do they, can they agree? Like, do they have any agreement over a shared attribute that God has? Like, is there any sense in which the God that they're talking about is the same? Well, it's, I mean, since at least these two are purely like relative descriptions, um, you can't really tell from them whether the, the thing is the same, right? <laughs> I mean, that is... Uh, um, and Philo and Demia, at least officially, agree with each other that the divine nature is is incomprehensible. <laughs> so, um, so is it the same or not the same? Like the, um, 
you can't really tell if the thing is the same, but the descriptions they're using for it are definitely different. And I was just showing how they can come apart, even though they don't have to come apart, right? And in, in traditional theology, they go together. <laughs> is that, uh, it, but, but so as far as the descriptions go, they're really completely different. So they, they, in a sense, have no agreement on that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're talking about different things. Yeah, that makes sense. It's just interesting for me to hold in my head because <laughs> you could say that they're all talking about a different God. Well, I mean, and I think, you know, this is one of the things that Hume is trying to teach here if you don't already know it. And it's one of the things that I'm often trying to teach when we read philosophical theology, that you have to pay really close attention to what the argument is. It's like if someone proves the existence of God, pay really close attention to what the argument is in order to figure out what they're proving. <laughs> because it's, you know, you can't take for granted that you know. <laughs> Um, that's usually, I mean, I, I mean, that as, as far as it goes, what Demia, uh, and Pamphilus say here is correct as a description of philosophical tradition, right? Up to a certain point in history, well, at least between certain points in history, right? Like the Epicureans were effectively atheists, uh, you know, whatever, but, um, that uh, like um, almost all philosophers agreed that God exists, but they didn't necessarily mean the same thing. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so that's um, um, interesting and important. Um, I mean, there's other things to be said about that from other points of view. Um, like, um, that philosophers will often say um, that the philosophical content of all religions is the same <laughs> um, or something to that effect. Okay. I mean, already Aristotle suggests something like that, but later people built a lot on it. Um, so it's kind of saying the other way around. Um, What's the relationship between those two things? Oh. I'm not sure. Anyway, I just want to mention that. All right. Uh, so that was a good question. More questions? <laughs> not for now. <laughs> okay. Um, So how should I organize this in the time I have left? I mean, I th so I guess I would say that um, Demia, as far as we know for real, although subject to the complications I was I, I was introducing, I, and Philo at least pretend um, uh, for the most part except for like a few slips where Philo lets something out, like what I just quoted from him, that uh, for the most part seem to be representing a pretty traditional theological point of view. So they say on the one hand, the divine nature is, is incomprehensible, but then they list a whole bunch of divine attributes like simplicity, infinity, perfection, unity, eternity, immutability, um, 
Um, for the most part, those actually can be understood as negative. They're, Ray, this is what's known as negative theology. It's not a contradiction to say that we know nothing about the divine nature, and yet we know blah, 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 if all that blah, blah, blah is just denying that God is X, Y, or Z. <laughs> um, I think Demi at some point actually quotes... Um, someone is saying just that. Am I getting this confused with something else? Maybe that was even in Kant rather than you. <laughs> I forgot. All things getting scrambled in my mind. But anyway, people will say something like, you know, when you say God is a spirit, you really just mean God is not a body. You don't mean that God is is more similar to the spirits we know than to the bodies, right? God is infinitely different from both of them. Like I said, that's called negative theology. Um, and they, to me especially, makes certain gestures towards it. Although no one explains it at length. Um, but... Um, but in contrast to that, we have Cleanthes' argument from design. Um, and again, it's important to realize that this is not, I mean, although arguments like this are traditional, the way Cleanthes carries it out and the conclusion he reaches is not at all traditional. It's as Philo and Demia later describe it, it's anthropomorphic or anthropomorphite. Right, so anthropomorphite literally means that you think that God has a human body, a body in the shape of a human, um, which there were um, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, all three who maintained that. Um, but uh, it um, ended up being branded as heretical in all three traditions. Well, in Judaism, it's a little hard to say what's heretical. But anyway, um, uh, um, Maimonides certainly considered it heretical. Um, but I'll oh, say so that's what it literally means. But then uh, they're using it more metaphorically to mean you're thinking of God as similar to human being, as on the model of a human being. Um, Right, and so he makes, this is the argument that he makes, the curious adapting of means to ends throughout all nature resembles exactly, though it much exceeds the productions of human contrivance, sorry, of human contrivance, of human design, thought, wisdom, and intelligence. Since therefore the effects resemble each other, we are led to infer by all the rules of analogy that the causes also resemble and that the author of nature is somewhat similar to the mind of man, though possessed of much larger faculties, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so this is the argument from design. And I mean, I think, you know, this is an argument that Hume is setting up the way he thinks it should be set up. That doesn't mean necessarily thinks it's a good argument, right? But it means like, if you're gonna make it, this is the way you should make it. And this is the conclusion you should draw, right? So the way you should make it is, well, a lot of things in this world look kind of like machines. Even the world as a whole looks kind of like a machine. Uh, parts kind of work together, whatever, it's kind of stable or something. Um, so, uh, uh, Actual machines are the product of human reason and will, and therefore we should conclude that all these natural things are uh, uh, effects of a similar cause. There is something that resembles human reason and will. Yeah. Um, what page number was that on, Professor? That was on 15, sorry, in part two, I think. Um, there's, you know, Cleanthes re repeats different versions of it as he goes on, but that's the that's that's the way he states it at first, and that's the basic argument. That that Demia, so Demia doesn't like it. Um, first of all, because Cleanthes' conclusion is 
not orthodox. It's not traditional. Um, and second of all, Demia doesn't like it because it's not certain. It's only right. It only establishes probability, not certainty. Um, whereas Philo's main objection, and I see I'm out of time, so I won't say more about this tonight, but Philo's main objection is that the analogy is just really weak, <laughs> right? He says, okay, the world, you know, animals are kind of like machines, but not very much like machines. <laughs> Why well, think the cause was similar? Um, and, uh, so again, Demia and Philo are like, seem to be on the same side, but they're really plus pressing Cleanthes for, from different directions for different reasons. And in the end, that's, you know, it's going to, that they're going to come apart. Um, okay. As I said, that's all I have time for now. And Wednesday... I don't know. Do people want me to try to come in if I can? <laughs> I mean, like the people who are here. Are... <laughs> I mean, if you come in person, I will come to lecture, but I have no idea who else will show up. <laughs> exactly. And again, like Josephine may well be banned from the campus at this point or whatever. So, <laughs> uh Lots of people are banned. From yeah, camp. exactly. So I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens, but maybe it's just not worth it if there's only going to be a couple people there. Anyway, I'll let you know whether it's remote or in person, <laughs> and I'll see you then one way or the other. Bye. Bye, Professor. <laughs>